Hello, film historians. I'm Derek, and I love old movies. We've got Sam the Sidekick here. Hello, and welcome to episode 31, the first episode of our all-Western movie month of March. March means Westerns. As well it should. And we're off to a big start. An auspicious start. An audacious start. Stop selling us and start telling us. So we will be looking at a film from director John Huston, starring naturally my least favorite actor of them all, Burt Lancaster, in 1960's The Unforgiven. Not to be confused with the Clint Eastwood film Unforgiven. Not really, no. And this film also has Audie Murphy. We like him. We do. And I suppose we'll have to see if this film fits into the Burt Lancaster paradox. Oh, we will for sure. You see, we've mentioned this before on the show, but the Burt Lancaster paradox is what happens when an actor you hate is in a film you love. And specific to Burt Lancaster, it's a problem I tend to always have with his films. You love his movies. I love them. But hate his performances. So much. I, I hate them so much. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing where this one falls. And this episode is low-key a request. Love requests. We have a special listener over in Barcelona, Spain. I've talked to her many times through the Instagram app, and she loves Burt Lancaster, and she loves this movie in particular. And we like making our listeners happy. Really, they're not just listeners. They're friends. Friend. Podcast friend. Over the world friend. And if you'd like to be one of our friends, all you have to do is get in touch on the socials. Tell them how. Well, there's the Facebook. I Love Old Movies, the podcast. There's also the Instagram. At I Love Old Movies, the podcast. Don't forget about El Twitter. At ILOM podcast. Or send us a good old-fashioned email. I Love Old Movies, the podcast at gmail.com. All one word. And while you're at it, be sure to check us out on Pet Rock Radio, where they are playing our past episodes, along with some of the best music you are going to hear anywhere. We'll link them in the description. So, shall we just jump into this? We absolutely shall. Hit the music! It's tough to sum up a man like John Huston. Do you talk about him as an award-winning screenwriter? Do you discuss him as a fine character actor in his own right? Or do you just stick to the man's celebrated and unimpeachable body of work as a director? This is a man who received 15 Oscar nominations as a director and screenwriter and actor, directed 15 actors to Oscar-nominated performances, and most incredibly directed not only his daughter, but also his father to Oscar-winning performances, making the Houstons the only Hollywood family with Oscar wins in three generations. Okay, so he sounds pretty legit. Well, that doesn't really begin to sum him up. Houston's first directing gig came after he had received a few Oscar nominations as a screenwriter, and he used that to convince Warner Brothers to give him a chance to direct. His first film, the Maltese Falcon is considered a classic of its genre and was critical, a critical film in the rise of Humphrey Bogart. And not George Raft. No. And let's just say Houston was in the Humphrey Bogart business after that. In the next 10 years, Houston and Bogart would work together on Across the Pacific, The Treasure of the Sierra Madre, Key Largo, and The African Queen. Wait, what? Good God! We've talked before about artists going through an incredible creative period, getting on a roll, so to speak. This was one heck of a roll. But during this time, he also made Moulin Rouge and the Red Badge of Courage and the Asphalt Jungle, which were also all classics in their own right. All in 10 years. I can't believe that. Oh, it gets better. Houston was a rebel. An iconoclast, you might say. So it might come as no surprise that he fought furiously against the HUAC, actually forming the Committee for the First Amendment in an attempt to combat and undermine what the HUAC was trying to accomplish. And so disgusted with them and what was happening to many of his colleagues, Houston left Hollywood and moved to Ireland specifically to get away from the HUAC. Now, the rest of the 1950s weren't as good to Houston, but he did make Moby Dick, which we'll be watching next month when we do Adventure Movie April, and into the early 60s when he made The Unforgiven and The Misfits. And he directed The Misfits? <laughs> what in the world? The rest of the 1960s didn't have any films that were really hits. And in the 1970s, he was acting a bit more, with roles in films like Chinatown and Battle for the Planet of the Apes. He also voiced Gandalf in the animated versions of The Hobbit and Return of the King that were made by Rankin Bass. 
He was also in Orson Welles' last film, The Other Side of the World. Now, his big directing gig that decade was The Man Who Would Be King, which is just an excellent film with Sean Connery and Michael Caine. Houston kept directing into the 80s with films like the World War II POW film Victory and the family musical Annie. For one of his last films, 1985's Pritzi's Honor, he became the oldest man to receive an Oscar nomination for Best Director. It was his final one, and making him a member of a very elite list of people to be nominated for an Oscar in five consecutive decades. Famed and skilled for his ability to tell tales of humanity and his directorial style of creating as he filmed, so as to cut down on editing and post-production, the man called the Ernest Hemingway of Hollywood died in 1987 at the age of 81. I want to watch a lot of his movies. And we will, especially since we actually have two coming up in Adventure Movie April. Okay, then. Known primarily as a documentarian, screenwriter Ben Maddow was given the job to adapt the novel The Unforgiven into the film that made it to screen. Working in Hollywood since the 30s and being openly affiliated with left-wing causes and publications, Maddow had his first screenplay credit with 1947's Framed. Frequent collaborations with John Huston followed as they worked together on The Asphalt Jungle, The Unforgiven, and a television episode for the Asphalt Jungle television series in the 1960s. He did a lot of work that he is considered uncredited for, most notably the film McCabe and Mrs. Miller, which was based on his own novel, McCabe. Wait, he did not get a credit for a film based on a novel he wrote? Nope. Maddow's final film was The Mephisto Waltz in 1970, and only two television writing credits followed that. Ben Maddow died in 1992 at the age of 83. Now, to hear us talk about the life and career of Burt Lancaster, go check out episode 1, Rope of Sand. And to hear about Audie Murphy, have a listen to episode 17, To Hell and Back. But for now, make yourself comfortable while we talk a little bit about one of the classiest, most graceful of all Hollywood actresses, Audrey Hepburn. It's easy to think of this Belgium-born Hollywood legend as some ubiquitous, always-working actress with scores of films, but in reality, if you take away her few television appearances, Hepburn only appeared in 27 movies, and yet, with a disproportionate amount of them being absolutely timeless classics, or even when the films themselves aren't, her performances are, she is rightly thought of as a screen legend. After having made a few films in Europe, Hepburn relocated to Hollywood in the early 1950s. In 1953, she released her first American film, Roman Holiday, which was a huge hit for her, and she won the Oscar as Best Actress. She continued the decade with films like Sabrina, where she earned another nomination, War and Peace, Love in the Afternoon, and O Risque de Se Perdre, where she got another nomination. But it was the 1960s where her status and reputation were solidified, with her image of being charming and graceful and elegant and stylish became a part of Hollywood lore. With films such as Breakfast at Tiffany's, Paris When It Sizzles, which was her second film opposite William Holden, Charade with Cary Grant, and My Fair Lady, all of these films did very well commercially, with Breakfast and the later Wait Until Dark earning her more Best Actress nominations. She retired from acting in 1967, but returned for four more feature films and one made-for-TV movie. There's mostly nothing spectacular here, except for one of my personal favorites, 1976's Robin and Marion, starring Sean Connery as Robin Hood and Robert Shaw as the Sheriff of Nottingham. While it's not a typical performance or role from her, it's definitely a film to check out if you've never seen it. In the 1980s, Hepburn dedicated herself to humanitarian work, even becoming a UNICEF ambassador, working in Ethiopia, Turkey, and Central America helping children. Still considered one of the greatest and most beautiful movie stars of all time, Audrey Hepburn died in 1993 at the age of 63. John Saxon got one of the more interesting introductions into the movie business. The Brooklyn-born actor was 17 and posed for the cover of a detective magazine. The cover was seen by an agent who signed him to a contract and got him in with Universal in 1954 as a bit player, making $150 a week. Oh man, for the days when you could just be discovered like that. No kidding. 
Saxon was on contract for 18 months before finally being used in a film, debuting in Running Wild in 1955. After that, Saxon played teen delinquents or brooding heartthrobs before graduating to his first A film, This Happy Feeling, in 1958. Now, after that, he signed a three-picture deal with HHL. This was Burt Lancaster's production company. And that association is what led him to be in The Unforgiven. By the 1960s, Saxon was getting both too old and too frustrated playing teen roles, so he went to Europe and began making films in Italy, returning to Hollywood to make The Appaloosa with Marlon Brando and appearing in several TV shows, notably The Bold Ones, from 1969 to 1972. It was in the 1970s that Saxon's career began taking some really interesting directions, appearing in Enter the Dragon with Bruce Lee, Canadian horror classic Black Christmas, turned up on TV shows like Wonder Woman and The Six Million Dollar Man, and then into the 80s, where a lot of horror fans will really recognize him as Nancy's father in the Nightmare on Elm Street series. And, of course, along the way, was making a lot of exploitation and B-film stuff from Europe and Asia, like Cannibal Apocalypse and Battle Beyond the Stars. The last few decades of Saxon's career were filled with smaller films and TV appearances, working infrequently right up until his death in 2020 at the age of 83. Okay, so low-key, I love John Saxon. Just a calm, cool guy in all his films. Maybe he didn't have the most range or anything, but I really love what he does. Yeah, he's always good. Based on the novel by Alan LeMay, the final film made by the HHL production company was, it's fair to say, a bit troubled. This the same company that made Run Silent Run Deep, Burt Lancaster's company. He's literally the L in HHL. Right. So it went like this. Original writer replaced. Original director, replaced. Budget, two million over. Co-star? Well, they wanted Richard Burton, but he demanded co-billing. Lancaster refused that, so Audie Murphy was brought in, because he was cheaper and his name would go lower on the poster. All this sounds bad. Oh, it gets worse. Audrey Hepburn fell off a horse and broke her back, sustaining injuries that may have contributed to a later miscarriage. She returned to complete the film, but basically disowned it after that. And then you had the arguments. Between John Huston, who wanted to make a film about racism, sort of a response to the searchers, and HHL, who wanted a commercially successful star vehicle for Lancaster. And one of the big losers here was John Saxon, who had a bunch of his scenes cut by the studio, much to Houston's chagrin. And Houston wasn't able to use his usual cinematographer due to scheduling issues, the result being there that those two men fell out and didn't speak for years. After all was said and done, Houston considered this by far his least favorite film. Why did he even do it? With so much turmoil, why not just walk away? Well, money. It's always money in situations like this. Houston's manor home in Ireland wasn't going to restore itself, and his art collection wasn't going to get any bigger on its own. So Houston didn't get to make the film he wanted at all? No. Audrey Hepburn hated it? Yeah. And Burt Lancaster didn't get the big hit he wanted? Nope. And HHL never produced a film again? Right. Oof. What's the tale of the tape on this one, Sam? Okay, so we have a 6.6 .6 on IMDb. All right. The audience score is 60% on Rotten Tomatoes, Ugh. and the tomato meter is 60%. The film won no awards, no. and it can be watched on Amazon Prime. Now, we're going to try something new at this point, a slight format change. Normally, we would sort of recap the film almost in real time, sharing our thoughts as we go, but mostly just describing the action. It's long. Mm. Not always the most interesting. No. And it begs the question, is this really the part of the show you want to hear? So for the month of March, we're going to play with the format a bit. Rather than just talk you through the film as we watch it, we're going to provide a synopsis to give you an idea of what the film is about, and then get into our thoughts on the film more quickly. Honestly, we've noticed our episode runtimes have been getting up there too, 
and it's important to us to be respectful of our listeners' time. We're hoping this change helps. As always, be sure to let us know what you think. If you guys hate it, let us know. If you like it, let us know. So let's get to it. The Unforgiven tells the story of the Zachary family, who live in Texas in post-Civil War era. Matilda, the mother of the clan, played by silent film star Lillian Gish, that also includes three brothers, Ben, Burt Lancaster, Cash, Audie Murphy, and Andy, Doug McClure, and a daughter that was adopted at birth, Rachel, played by Audrey Hepburn. The family is generally prospering, and Rachel has a few marriage options, including Ben. But on the eve of a cattle drive, a stranger shows up and provided information that Rachel is a member of the Kiowa Nation, and shortly after they are visited by members of the tribe who want Rachel back, with their leader Lost Bird claiming that she is his sister. Clearly this old guy, this Abe Kelsey guy, he told the Kiowa as well. The Kiowa kill Rachel's boyfriend, which turns his grieving family against her. And Ben has Kelsey tracked down and set to be hung. Always with the hangings. If you know a better way to settle a score in the Wild West, I'd like to hear it. Hey, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. With noose around his neck, Kelsey comes clean, explaining that years ago, he and Will Zachary, Ben's dad, led a retaliatory raid against the Kiowa when they found a baby girl, and rather than kill her, Will took her. Kelsey even says the Kiowa took his own son as ransom for an exchange of the two children. This doesn't fit with the known narrative that the son was killed in the raid. This old guy is just a rumor-spreading troublemaker. That's what Ben thinks. It's sure what he wants everyone to think. This is a bombshell reveal. Anyway, Kelsey ends up hung, but Ben's business partner is not convinced the story was a lie. And he demands that Ben turn Rachel over to the Kiowa, or their business partnership will be off. And back at the homestead, Matilda admits the whole thing is true. Oh, no. Matilda. That might have been helpful to say before the guy was hung for lying. And unable to accept that his sister is a native, Cash, the racist, leaves and abandons the family. And then the Kiowa attack. And it's serious. A big fight ensues. Matilda dies, Andy is wounded, and facing down certain death, Ben and Rachel pledge to wed if they survive. And then, when Lost Bird shows up to take Rachel, she shoots him dead. And Cash comes back to turn the tide of the battle. Hey, when you're facing down hopeless odds and a horde of hostile enemies, Audie Murphy is definitely the guy you want riding into the rescue. Totally true. The battle over, the tribe flees, and Rachel and her two brothers survive. The end. Okay. Synopsis done. Lean and mean. Let's pro and con this guy. My pros. Number one, I'm going to start with John Saxon's criminally underserved Johnny Portugal character. He seemed like he was a really interesting guy, and his tension with Cash exposed Cash's racism. And his tension with Ben showed his overprotectiveness of Rachel. And his brief connection with Rachel made suggestions about her own origins. It made him an interesting catalyst character, exposing truths about our leads while never really revealing too much about himself. I'm not a fan of whitewashed casting, but if I have to overlook Audrey Hepburn as a Kiowa, I will overlook John Saxon as a Navajo or Apache or whatever nation he might have been part of. With Saxon having so many scenes been cut out, it would have been nice to have seen more of his character and his arc. Number two, the supporting cast. While I have a few complaints about the leads, I mean, obviously, I, I think Burt Lancaster took more away from the film than he added to it, I feel the supporting cast was really good. Audie Murphy is solid. Lillian Gish was a lot of fun to watch, especially in the siege scene where she handled her rifle like a pro. The Rollins family were diverse and believable, and the scene with Joseph Wiseman's Abe Kelsey, just before he was hung, was gripping. Probably the best acting in the film. A strong supporting cast always makes a film better than it might otherwise be, and this is no exception to that rule. Number three, the anti-racism message. Now, to be fair, this was more an intention by John Huston than it was overtly put on screen. The native characters are portrayed as 
as little more than stoic and vengeful stereotypes, and having them called horrible epithets that I won't repeat here seemed abhorrent, especially when it was never challenged. But at the end of it, this is the story about how white settler colonialist types did some real harm to the Kiowa tribe, and did it for selfish reasons. And then how the racism built into the Zachary family, especially in Cash, broke the family apart. Houston wanted to make a statement here about racism in America. I'm not convinced that he pulled off what he had in mind, but it's clear that he had it in mind, and that has value. Now, for the first time ever, I'm going to add a fourth pro. I loved the nice, long, slow setup. We see the Zacharys and their lives. They're prospering. They have a piano, a piana. They're friends. We see Cash's racism. We see Ben's Bert Lancasteriness. We see the Rollinses and the proposed marriage between Charlie and Rachel and George's desperation and Rachel's idealized perfection and Andy's youthful exuberance, Rachel's special horse and her connection to it, all of it. It's great. It sets up the individuals and the families and it shows how much they have. And it foreshadows how much they will lose. Their lives are good, but it's built on a lie and that will destroy them all just really good storytelling. My cons. Number one, Audrey Hepburn is really miscast in this. She's just too Audrey Hepburn for her role. Her casting is such an obvious attempt to capitalize on her in-the-moment star power, as well as a chance to outcast Natalie Wood in The Searchers. The problem with some big movie stars is that they are so indelibly one character in every film, and that's a problem here. You've already got Burt Lancaster doing his routine, and with Audrey doing hers, there's a lot of star power, front and center. But there's not a lot of great acting. And her character doesn't even look remotely indigenous, which breaks down the central conflict of the film. She doesn't look believable as a sto stolen Kiowa child. And that's the premise of the entire film. Now, I know, they were never going to cast an indigenous actress in this role in 1960. But nevertheless, I feel they got the casting wrong here. Number two, the cinematography. The cinematography in this film is terrible. I literally put my head in my hands during the chase scene with Johnny Portugal. The shots and the camera movement combined with the cheap film stock looked just awful. I don't hate this film, but I do hate how it's shot. It's not well shot at all. It's too tight framing, weird camera movements, and strange actor positions in frame, and it consistently proved to be a distraction and pulled me out of the movie watching experience. Number three, the big overwrought music score by Dmitry Tiomkin. The music in this film goes from being dark and weird and then transitioning into this Elmer Bernstein light classic Western movie bombast, and the effect of that doesn't work. Too often in the film, the music seems in the way, not so much enhancing things, but impeding them. It doesn't sound mixed properly, with the score at times sounding like it's coming from somewhere other than the world shown in the film. Now, I don't want to rag on Dmitri too much here. He's a legendary film composer in his own right. He won four Oscars and six Golden Globes for his work. But like so many other people involved in this project, he was just A, not right for the job, or B, let down by technical aspects that he did not control. In his case, specifically the mix. And is this a watch for you? It's close. I feel in the end it's a watch. There's a really good film here, but the opportunity to make it was squandered. If it was intended to be compared favorably to The Searchers, it falls incredibly short. But so much talent was involved in creating this film, it's a bit amazing that a better result wasn't delivered. As much as I love John Huston, he wasn't right for this film. And HHL wasn't the right production company to make it. Somewhere in an alternate universe, a superior version of this film was made. And in that universe, I love that film very much. You're up. Okay, so my pros. One, the three guys on the horse. They were literally just jumping all over each other in the background of the scene. It was hilarious. Every time the camera would cut back in their direction, they were jumping on the horse, on each other, or pushing each other off the horse. 
They just did not care about what was happening in the scene, and it was pretty funny to go from watching an actual normal conversation happen between a group of people just to cut back to see that going on in the background. Two, the scenes with the large groups of horses. These were kind of exciting, and there were a lot of them. I liked watching the groups of horses being herded all around the fields and hills. These scenes were overall just very energetic. And one of the things that I like most about Western movies is horses running around and hearing their hooves stomp on the ground. We certainly got a lot of that in this film, so that was fun. Three, the piano, or the pie-anna. It was pretty, and I liked when the mother would play it. It did seem a bit unreasonable that Ben could carry it by himself, though. It was sort of a different shape to the pianos that I'm used to seeing in real life, so I thought it was interesting to look at, and I really liked the different panels that got flipped up on it. It was just a nice little addition to the film that I would have liked to see more of, and I was sad when it got destroyed. Okay, now my cons. 1. The film quality. The movie just looked... not great. I was going to say that it seemed grainy, but I think that blurry and unclear would be more accurate. And honestly, I don't get it. It looked like it was filmed on the cheapest camera available. We've watched films from the 1940s that were clearer than this one. Overall, it just made the film less visually appealing and harder to watch. 2. The cinematography. Every shot was just so ugly. Like, a lot of the shots had a lot of stuff just crammed on screen, and not in a way that looked full or purposefully chaotic, but instead just messy. People were in and out of shots so you could just barely see them, and at several points the camera moved or panned over, but it wasn't smooth and came across pretty choppy. For a film that was praised for its cinematography, it had to have been the film's biggest weakness. 3. Ben and Rachel There was some weird tension going between them right from the start of the film. Plus, Rachel was throwing herself at Ben every chance she got. It made all of their interactions together awkward and honestly just uncomfortable. Like, sure, I know that they aren't blood-related, but they were still raised together. As siblings. So yeah, they had a brother-sister makeout session, and I was not a huge fan of it. And what is your recommendation for this? Should people give this a watch? Well, there were definitely parts of the film that I think could have been done better. But overall, I enjoyed it, so I would give this a watch. Okay. And I wonder where it fits into the Burt Lancaster paradox, because I can't say, like, I loved this film. I, I, I wanted to, but I don't feel I loved it, you know? Yeah, that's true. For me, it's almost a, a soft Burt Lancaster paradox, because I didn't love the film. I liked it, Yeah, but I still hated Burt Lancaster in yeah. it. Yeah. 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 Well, with that, we come to the end of episode 31. It really was episode 30 fun. There it is. Thanks for listening, everyone. Did you enjoy the slightly different new format? If so, or if not, send us a comment and let us know. And be sure to tune in next week when we look at another Burt Lancaster film. Yeah. As we continue all Western March. This one is also a special request, and you know how much we like to honor those, but this one is doubly special because it's not just a Burt Lancaster film, but also stars one of your favorite tough guy actors. Please say Lee Marvin. Please say Lee Marvin. Lee Marvin. Yes! So we are back next week with The Professionals. Be sure to check it out. And until then, be sure to watch more movies and let people know about our podcast. Listeners spreading the word is the best way for us to grow. So tell your friends. Tell your enemies. You never know. They might like harboring dark family secrets as much as you do. Maybe even more. For Sam the Sidekick, I'm Derek, and I love old movies.
Additional research for I Love Old Movies, the podcast, is done by Nikki Weatherden. Audio clips come from freefx.co.uk. Images are used through the provisions of fair use, and our theme song, Burning Bridges, is by The Crocs.